Hello and good morning, Sports Capital Symposium. Welcome to day two. I am Dan Kaufman, Sport Techies Managing Director, and we have another great day in store for you. Later today, we'll hear from Facebook, uh, SSB, they'll talk about investing in analytics, Comcast Sports Tech Accelerator, FC Barcelona, Paul Rabel, Premier Lacrosse League founder, and we'll close out the day with a really important conversation among some of the most powerful and successful women in sports and business, including Black Girls Code CEO, Kimberly Bryant. If you have not donated to Black Girls Code, please make sure that you do. They are our partner, our nonprofit partner for this conference, and we encourage everyone to make a donation, no matter how small it is, please uh, do that. You can do it very easily if you head to their booth within the Expo tab on the left-hand side of your screen. So make sure you do that at some point today. I wanna thank our partners. We couldn't do it without you. DC Lottery, Deloitte, Comcast Business, Comcast Sports Tech, NFLPA, SSB, Tally, Capsule, ColorNet Printing and Graphics, Sports Digita, Fan AI, please go check out their booths as well in the Expo tab when you have time. Thank you very much to all of you. But right now, I'm excited to introduce our opening keynote for day two of Sports Capital Symposium, a fireside chat with Ted Leonsis and Zach Leonsis of Monumental Sports, connecting generations then and now. Ted and Zach, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, son. How Zach, you? you've been like a son to me. <laughs> you've always been a father figure yeah. to me. You know that. Uh, what'd you think of day one? I thought it was awesome. And I think this is a big new opportunity for programming. You think the amount of high quality teaching that was done yesterday, I watched the entire event um, and it really worked. I really think that the format and the fidelity of the connection was spectacular. And um, I think Sporteki um, and all of the presenters have done fantastic work. I thought it was awesome. Um, I love the panel that Sashi led. And uh, I thought the session with Dee Smith yesterday was awesome. I love the listening to Dee and to Howard. I see you've uh, modified your setup. You're flexing in the background. You've got your uh, stable a bit. I just wanted to remind you. Right. <laughs> all right. Team. Well, we're, uh, we're skipping introductions here and getting right into it. The topic of this fireside chat between us is connecting generations. And so I want to start with putting yourself almost in my shoes. 30 years ago, 1990, the internet is really starting to boom. What are the big key trends that you spotted then and how did they manifest themselves in reality? Um, well, first, uh, I'll say that it was great to see um, such a diverse and great group of panelists and a great mix of young people, young executives, and people who've been in the industry a long time. I, I touched my first computer in college in 1976, and then I was there when the IBM PC was launched. I worked with IBM in Florida. Uh, in the 1980, 1981, was there and helped to launch the Macintosh in 84. And so I just saw this popularization, if you will, of technology and then got prime seats, if you will, on the birth of the Internet at America Online. And what the driver has always been and continues to be is that the DNA of technology and everything we're experiencing is Moore's law, faster, better, cheaper, half the price. And this network effect where the more people that get into your community, uh, the more important it is. When, when we took America online public, uh, there were less than a million people around the world who were connected That's and most were connected at 1,200 and 2,400 baud. Now there's eight people, eight billion people on the globe, and more than four billion are connected all through high speed. And so, so I've always felt positive. I hope I've I've taught you that that today's the worst day the internet will ever be. There'll be more people online tomorrow, more bandwidth, more innovation, more application. 
and we have to trust that um, people will do the right things with these tools in their hand, but we also have to verify and make sure that there's not bad action. And, you know, as we hand the baton over to the next generation, uh, people in their 20s and 30s, I have to ask you, um, are you happy with the way you've seen the industry develop? And we're in this throes of social media. Do you think it's um, helping society or or not bringing great benefit to society? I think that's the perfect and appropriate question to ask right now, because um, I'll answer this in sort of two parts. Directly to answer your question, I think there are three things that um, have two sides of the coin. I think one, personalization is really going to start to boom. It's already begun with recommendation engines, and we see that we're getting ads catered to us. And in this beginning period of time, I think that we'll really start to feel like, wow, that personal touch is really important, and it helps me become more efficient. It's more catered to what I really want, it gets me to the answer faster. It makes me feel like the brands that I interact with really engage with me. But I do worry that at some point it could get pretty creepy. Um, and so you're right, we really do need strong leadership from these technology vendors, technology companies, even you know, direct to consumer businesses like our own, we need just about how we interact with people in the future. I also think that, you know, big data, machine learning, AI, you talked about Moore's law, that is only going to get bigger, faster, stronger. And, you know, what happens when it gets to a point where um, it's almost our peer, I think there's definitely going to be inevitable regulation when that when we get there or maybe it'll be too late. And that I think does keep some people up. I think a third thing that people are really interested in these days is authenticity. I think people are interested in, dare I say, radical authenticity. Tell us how you really feel and how does this brand really feel? What does this brand really stand for? And if you really stand for it, do you really stand by it? Do you speak up? Do you say things about it? And, you know, I think that uh, a lot of different brands have done a good job in terms of social justice. I think others have have been a little bit of laggards. But then I also think you see, you know you see more brash media networks like Barstool Sports getting a lot of attention and whatnot. Um, I think authenticity is good, um, but when it's channeled towards sort of a brash nature, it can be a little bit yeah. different. You touched on something that we're wrestling with right now in pro sports, and we're in a way in the middle of it, which is identity um, and safety, security, integrity of your identity, especially in a social media, social networking world is important. Yet here we are in sports and we can't allow people into our building. We can't play games with fans in the seats. And so there's so much work, so much investment going on right now in rapid testing. Uh, obviously next season, the leagues wanna be able to play with fans, who knows what the timing of that is, but there's gonna be a platform that develops. Um, we've made an investment in a company called Clear, and we are using Clear at, in the NHL bubble, which you, know, you take, uh, Download the app, take your picture, um, you get a lot of information as you get tested. That information goes into the database and in real time says, yes, you're cleared, you can go in. Well, you can see at some point it's going to be, did you get inoculated? Did you get the vaccine? We're going to need to know that to get back to business. And there's 8 billion people around the world. And then all of a sudden you realize that that health pass kind of system can get us back to work, can get us back to playing, can get us back to being a social society. But now you've got your health information as a part of your identity. And so having a balance and looking at that from a, from a very um, important way, a non-political way, I think is going to be a big challenge. 
And it's funny how sports has driven a lot of this. I mean, the NBA, we were there. We had an NBA Board of Governors meeting in the afternoon. And then that night, um, Adam Silver, over text, shut the league down, which dominoed all of the other leagues, which really gave businesses permission that this is really, really serious. And you know, I like to say that in a odd way, Adam Silver, Gary Bettman, who was our keynote yesterday, the commissioners are like the head of the Federacy. They're like our presidents and we're called governors, right? We take their lead and um, the sports uh, community has done the right thing in the right way. Creating the bubbles were very, very innovative. Um, no negative tests. We're able to play the games and uh, sports has really taken a sports leadership has taken a front and center um, leadership position in society and business. I agree. Sports is at the intersection of so many big trends, whether it be, um, you know, cord cutting and cord shaving in the linear space. Uh, we see obviously the public policy track colliding with sports, with sports betting and the like. Um, we're very lucky that way. So question for you, post pandemic, what are three trends that you think will really accelerate in the new normal? Um, well, I, I'm not sure we're ever going to be post pandemic. I think we've all been awakened to that viruses in our computer systems and networks and human viruses. We have 8 billion people. Um, you know, we, we helped to invent the term viral marketing, which now I hope to live down when we introduced AIM, which was the first, uh, you know, instant messaging virally marketed product. But the more people you have, enumerated and denominator, the, the more speed which will get done. So we have to constantly be vigilant and innovate and make sure that we're using machines and technology to come up with the next generation of vaccination for the next one that comes out faster, not unlike what we're doing with battling viruses from from hackers, from from uh, state-sponsored kind of hacking. So I think this will be with us forever. Uh, what I do see for our business is the uh, gamification driven by data. I mean, we, we've made investments and we've been deeply involved with DraftKings and with Sport Radar uh, and William Hill. I thought Joe's presentation yesterday was magnificent because it was, he's a lawyer, he's running a data-driven organization with high levels of humanity. That was really- yeah. personal experience. I thought that was beautiful. That was really spectacular. And, and Zach, you've been playing uh, video games and we can talk about, well, the lead that you've taken in esports, but you can see how, if there's a DraftKings, a sport radar, big data informing traditional sports, how much bigger that's going to be 10 years from now in in esports. So you should talk about what you see happening in esports, because we believe as a family, esports is going to be bigger than traditional sports at some point. Well, bigger than just esports. I mean, you may recall that we actually announced that we were going to host this conference in person basically a year ago. And when the pandemic hit, there it did cross my mind to go, oh, geez, we're not going to be able to host this at all. We should just postpone to next year. But I think that one of the key critical factors for us saying, no, we should just pivot to a virtual format is because a lot of the trends that we have tried to orient this conference around, whether it be media and streaming, whether it be sports betting, or whether it be um, esports, I think those are the three big trends that are going to accelerate post pandemic. Um, you know, the streaming wars between Disney Plus, HBO Max, Netflix, Prime Video are astounding right now. And every single sports league and every single sports network 
is quickly evolving its OTT strategy. That's not going away because we see that ratings are shifting almost every other year level to the national level. And I don't think that's going to go anywhere. I think everyone's curious to see what does the pandemic do to cord cutting and cord shaving? Does it accelerate the trend or does it stabilize it because people want at home entertainment? I think we'll find that out pretty soon. Um, Esports, I think, has had a great opportunity here. It hasn't been a windfall. They haven't been taking advantage financially of the pandemic. But what esports has enjoyed is a great demo experience. I think interest in esports has never been higher. The viewership's never been better. And for that period of time when live sports really were paused, esports was the one live event category that people could go and watch. And um, you know, I think the 2K League, for example, did an excellent job. I really give Brendan Donahue a lot of credit for quickly acting and saying we're going to pivot and do our entire league remotely. And I'm going to figure out how to do a 23-team cloud-based production high enough quality to broadcast on ESPN2 and show the linear world um, what this looks like. And, you know, the viewership on Twitch far exceeded the league's goals, which was fabulous. But the fact that we also paired ESPN2 with that, it was awesome. And then, you know, from the sports betting experience, I look at, you know, we really just have a soft launch at Capital One Arena right now. Joe Asher described it yesterday as a pop-up store experience. You know, we've converted the box office in the F Street lobby in a socially distanced manner where people can go and place their first legal sports bets in the Mid-Atlantic. And the line is flowing through and out the door. It makes me wonder what will it look like when we have our real sports book experience, 25,000 or so square feet. Um multiple floors, and we're post-pandemic, right? There isn't the social distance guidelines and whatnot. What will that experience look like? Will the change, will Virginia and Maryland come online? And if so, how can we bring so many of these things together? Will we be able to offer more sports betting opportunities on esports? Will we be able to offer more alternate gaming feeds via direct-to-consumer product like Monumental Sports Network? Will there be different packages and offerings, whether they be a zero latency betting feed, a one window experience where you can watch a game and actually place a bet as well? I think it's really exciting to think about all the things that could come. And I think the pandemic has accelerated some of those to a certain degree. Yeah. And I think how we sell, what we sell, I mean, the great thing since we've made our investment in Axiomatic and Team Liquid, and now we're investors in Fortnite via Epic Games and Neantic. And so we have a front seat, and that is a key learning. Uh, being early, getting a seat at the table, and and taking the slings and arrows on, on well, this will never work. You know, you're, you're too fringy. Uh, time will cure that, and and we are seeing now the mass adoption of esports and video game culture, and you'll see that all businesses essentially start with some kind of killer app, one point of entry, and then they start to gain tertiary experience and capabilities. You know, AOL started it all, right? We went the first internet company to go public. We sold access. Then we were about email. Then we were about messaging. Then we were about content, right? Then we were about streaming. Um, so you could see Fortnite. People think of Fortnite, oh, it's a game and maybe now there'll be competitive gamers. But Fortnite will probably end up being a platform where they're already putting concerts, they'll be a convener, they'll be the next it already is. Facebook, right? The kids you saw yesterday, the eSports speakers, they were already wired up, right? They had their- Yeah, you can tell the eSports, they had their headset on. Wow, look at you with your headset. I'm, I'm still relevant, I'm still yeah, relevant. And, and so, so, we have to look always at what is the higher calling of the organization of the killer app. It's like, oh, you bought a hockey team in 1999. 
uh, when I was president of America Online, the core service, everyone said, why would you buy a hockey team? And I said, I didn't buy a hockey team. You want what's behind you. <laughs> I think I bought a um, platform to do good and to build a platform that you can put other teams in, that you could build a big community and that it could have a higher calling of it's a content company, it's an e-commerce company, it'll be a great business, but it also will have that, that more important um, mission, which is bring the community closer together. We're, we're both in Washington, DC. Uh, there's never been a more divided time in our country, I guess since the Civil War. I mean, when you think about it, we have warring points of view, anger, vitriol, and a lot of it's here in Washington, DC. And the only time our community has been united and came together was when the Capitals won the Stanley Cup and we had our parade, when the Mystics won the championship and the Nationals won the World Series. Those three, were really, really binding commu uh, communal events. It made our mayor start to refer to DC as the district of champions. You just won with the team a, another championship in the NBA 2K. And, and now the higher calling is for our community to be uniters, not dividers. And we're being seen as a winning economy, a winning community and the role, the central role that sports plays, uh, I think outshines, outweighs the economic value that is created, although these have become very, very important, highly valued businesses. Agreed. I think uh, working in sports, a sports team is unlike any other business on the planet. You have way more shareholders than, or stakeholders, I should say, than any other kind of business. You are beholden to your community. It's really the community that owns the teams. You hold a little morale. You do have an obligation to stand for what's right. You do have an obligation to leverage the platform for social good. Um, you do have an obligation to be a good neighbor. And I hope we I hope we do our our best with that. I appreciate you've always been a leader in that space. I've certainly learned a lot from you on that. So question for you. So what advice do you have for an executive who's trying to redefine their business, pivot, figure out what's next in the midst of a pandemic? How do you navigate such a terrible crisis like the one that we're in right now? Well, I think it starts with being close to your current customers. You really have to uh, fight through and learn every little thing that a customer wants to be satisfied today, but at the same time, you've got to be able to uh, be curious and look at other industries and look at what young people are doing, look at what's happening in art and fashion and music, read books, read lots of magazines, because the mashing up of the new and the existing is what will pop out something dramatically great in the new. And, um, you know, the other day I was asked, um, if you were me, what would you pursue academically? And I said, well, if you want a job and a career, I would study math and coding. Um, that's where all the jobs will be. Um, there's a global demand for people to know how to code. If yeah. you want a life, I would be a liberal arts major. <laughs> That's what I was. And, and you know, what I've been able to do through liberal arts and is to mash up lots of different things from different industries to try to bring something new or to see something. So I saw sports as a SaaS business. And I remember my friends at AOL or in the industry, they'd say, what are you talking about? So, well, what is a software service company all about? It's reoccurring revenues. Well, look at our business. We have season tickets. 
Uh, that's a big driver. We renew our season tickets at 90, 95% every year. And we raise prices. We have long-term naming rights deals. Our media deals are with the biggest balance sheets companies in the world in their 10, 15 years. We are a SaaS business. SaaS businesses get valued at 10 to 15 times. When Steve Ballmer came in and bought the bought the Clippers, it's essentially what he looked at. I, he, he grew up in the software business, understood reoccurring revenues, and bought the Clippers at a good multiple. We all celebrated that, but he was absolutely right that these are great businesses because of the reoccurring revenues. If you could give yourself, go back in time and give your 30 year old self some advice, what would it be? Um, well, it's advice that I give you that um, there's, there's an ongoing drumbeat around what success is. And this is a good point. always having to declare what is true victory in life is important. So for me, it was um, it was falling in love, getting married, having children, having grandchildren. That's okay. like on the top of my list. My and, wife is upstairs, she's not awesome. And, and, but you have to have a definition of what you want to accomplish. And so, so you know, I've said I want to be loved, beloved, I don't want to be the richest guy. And there's a lot of people that don't know what victory is. And so, so I didn't know until I had my reckoning, you know, as you know, I had my life defining and reckonings, you know, some will get sick, someone will pass away who you love, an expectation won't be meet, met. We all have our reckonings. My reckoning was, oh gosh, how I've been programmed, do good in school, get a good job, make a lot of money, full stop. Yep. That was not what I was going to miss when the plane was going down. And so I hope I've shared that with people that, and it's not balance, it's basically um, knowing what's important, knowing where your happiness and self-actualization comes from, and then trying to weave that into your job. I think the credit that I give to your generation as opposed to mine is that you care about things like that. You were talking about authenticity. You can smell bullshit a mile away. You don't want to work with companies that you don't like the leadership. Um, yesterday, I thought it was very meaningful when in Sashi's um, panel, when he said, before I go and look at a company, I go to their website to see who's behind it, who's on the board of directors. Um, you know, we have the most, the most diverse partnership ownership group in all of sports. Women, we have black owners, we have Latino owners, we have the most female uh, women owners in, in sports. And that was by design. And then people say, oh, your organization is doing well. And we go, yes, see, it works. Diversity, having many voices, seats at the table, that organically flows down through the organization and I think uplifts what the company can accomplish. Couldn't agree more. Um, you're obviously an entrepreneur. I think that we share entrepreneurial tendencies. I think our organization is entrepreneurial. What do you think are the defining characteristics of, an, of a successful entrepreneur? I think there are a lot of people listening who are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs, start their own company, um, but they, they haven't gotten around to it. And maybe now's a better time than ever to try to start your own thing. What's the qualities you look for in an entrepreneur? You know, last night after the conference, I was invited to a Georgetown University American Studies uh, reunion, 50 years old, the program. And uh, I told people I started my first business on the campus of Georgetown University. 
1976, I read an article in the Washington Post, started reading newspapers early, and it said 30 million tourists are coming into Washington, D.C. to celebrate the bicentennial. And I was a poor kid, and I had a rich roommate, and I said, there's got to be something we can sell to 30 million tourists. And he said, um, well, you have a lot of get up and go, and I'm lazy. You come up with the idea and do the work, and I'll fund it. Yeah. And um, I started a snow cone vending business, red, white, and blue snow cones, be a patriot, eat a snow cone. And just getting into the business, having to buy the ice, buy the flavors, get the Eccles snow cone machine, find the corner by being the first one up in the morning to get there, learning how to sell. I did every single job. And my belief is that you have to have the vision, the strategy, the big picture, but you really have to know how to do all of the little things. And your motivation has to be not, I hate when I talk to entrepreneurs on, uh, they, they talk to me about the exit. Yeah. Go, you don't even have an entrance yet. You're trying to get money to launch the business and you're talking about an exit. You have to really have a real reason that you're doing something. What problem are you solving? Uh, what industry are you improving? And I also look at, as an individual, do you have fortitude, integrity, grit? We've seen in sports the major defining uh, winning trait is grit. I mean, I, last night was unbelievable. Jeff Bennett, who owns Tampa Bay, Good friends of ours, Zach, right? He's an investor with us in sports teams. Uh, we beat them in 2018, unbelievable series, and then we won the Stanley Cup. Last year, he had the greatest team with the greatest record ever, right? It was like one of the historic teams, and they lose in the first round in a sweep. It was devastating, just as we had had incredible setbacks, devastating setbacks. And the critics, the bloggers, the media, they just beat you up, the fans beat you up. You have to have fortitude. And last night he wins in overtime to go to the Stanley Cup Finals, yep. One, yep. one season, one year later. And so having that integrity, that, that fortitude to overcome obstacles, to not get too high with the high or too low with the lows, I think is the defining characteristic of a big winner in business. I agree. The difference between winning and losing is so small. When the Capitals won the Stanley Cup in 2018, and sorry for so much Stanley Cup talk, but um, I mean, we, we started the first round down 2-0. We lost both of our home games and we won game three in Columbus in overtime. They hit the post, I think, on us a minute or two minutes before we scored in overtime. And then we won three games after that and we started rolling. But I mean, we're like an inch away from maybe getting swept in the first round instead of winning the Stanley Cup. So it, it, it is so close. Yeah, sports is the only place where luck, I mean, that's why sports, What that's why when you win, mm -hmm. I'm taking companies public. Um, I didn't cry. We, we won the Stanley Cup. We win the WNBA championship. You cry because of all the pain and anguish, but so also hard. because how hard it is staying healthy, not having a bad call by the officials. I mean, a four-minute power play in overtime last night. The Islanders <laughs> killed it off, but it's like that doesn't happen in business. Yeah. Like yeah. not someone doesn't come into your office and say, you know, here's a here, here's a penalty for you, and then luck, just as you said, and it's why consistency and ongoing excellence because you've got to be there all the time. You have to keep yeah. knocking on the door, and then there is something about winning that gives you as an organization, gives you as a business, you can get the cycle going up. Turnarounds, rebuilds, which we've been through 
together are really, really difficult, but every business, every team will have to have that pivot, have to have that rebuild, that sense of rejuvenation. Yeah, I think there are always two ways you can go. You can either fold and call it a day, or you can kind of double down and say, maybe with some colorful language. Like what, what companies do you admire? What who, who are the brands, the new brands that your generation go, mm -hmm. this is an awesome company and awesome technology that I want to band and brand with? It's a good question. I mean, I love Shinola. Perhaps I'm biased, but Shinola has such a great brand presence. I love that it stands for Americana. I love that it stands for sort of rise of the rest. I love that it stands for a downtrodden city um, that's on the mend because America loves a comeback. I love that. So, all right, we're getting the five minute warning. So I want to do a little bit of a speed round. Um, fine. All right. Favorite sports memory. I think this will be easy. Yeah. Parade. Okay. Parade in the mall. Worst sports memory. If you're going to ask the good, you got to ask the bad. I think it was 2016. We're at Madison Square Garden. This is my worst memory. <laughs> have a one goal lead if we win we move on to the next round the finals wizards are playing in atlanta uh, if we win we go to the next round the houston finals Pain. and i say to you and mom um, i can't believe it we have both teams the same moment yeah. and then nene misses a rebound and al whatever horford puts it back in we lose uh we we get called for a penalty. They score. They win in overtime, and we lose both games. We were, we were like right there, and that was probably the double punch that was the worst memory. And you? We're sitting next to each other. We just sort of stared into the abyss for a full couple <laughs> of minutes in silence after that. It was Chris Kreider. He scored with a minute 33 left. That was very frustrating. You win some, you lose some. Um, best friend in the sports industry or a leader who you really admire? Well, I'm in love with Peter Guber. He's my I love him too. He's my friend. He's a storyteller. Um, I'll never forget this when we decided to do esports investing together. He said, uh, "We don't even need to sign anything. We'll be partners. We'll laugh together. We'll cry together." And I said, "How could I have a better partner than that?" I agree. He's the best. Um, best show on TV right now. I know you and mom are avid binge watchers of shows. Um, well, we've been streaming very erudite British crime mysteries. We just finished uh, DCI Banks, uh, and now we've started an Amazon. Um, uh, it's called Bosch, and so we're we're deep into uh, the methodologies of police and detectives. And it's so much better. I mean, it's interesting how, how streaming is where the quality is, right? It's no longer network TV of content. commercials. They don't even have the budgets anymore. And so the Netflix and Amazons and Hulus have the budgets because they have the consumers and they make the best products. The number one thing people should stop doing these days um, look what's trending and associating trending with importance. I, I looked today and there wasn't a single thing that was trending uh, on Twitter that I said, oh, I have to click to learn about that. How about you? Well, I think people often look for answers. They, they have questions about the world and society and they, they seek answers because it seems unexplainable or it seems too plain and simple to just have happened like that. And um, we shouldn't look to the internet and social media for those answers. I remember that. my one of my favorite sayings is an old sports saying, which is no one knows nothing. Yeah, you say that often. To the experts, to thine own self be true and you have to find your own way. All right, last question. What's something you are truly thankful for? Oh, I think I'm truly help, thankful right now that in our organization and in our family, we've been healthy.
I mean, you just look at what's happening um, and, and because we've been healthy, we've been able to spend our time and the bubble is a great um, metaphor for what we've been able to do. If you stay healthy, you can then do your job and you can also provide a platform for social justice. And so we'll probably look back and say this was a time where we were able to get that balance of business um, or keeping our eye on the ball and what's important in terms of social justice and we kept people healthy. And I'm also very grateful and thankful that I have a wonderful family. So yeah. I think that well, family's got to be a given. We'll, we'll say that. We'll say that's a given. I'm thankful that um, instead of folding under pressure, I think that our industry has shown a lot of grit because our industry has been, I would argue, the hardest hit. We can't play our normal games in front of live fans right now. And we'll get back to that. But, um, you know, the season could have just been canceled. They weren't. And, uh, you know, our our yesterday, she eminent domained our building. We own the building. She's Kinda, the building. Yeah, right. Right. We, we can't. Can 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 do this. And the only people who can go in it will use it as a voting station. It's awesome. So switching out um, Sometimes passion for grit, I think, has its benefits, and I think a lot of people have been doing that. And then on occasion, I'm very thankful for a good red wine uh, during the pandemic. All right. Thank you, Dad. This was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. I think we are at time, um, and so I will welcome Dan and the Sport Techie team back on stage to transition us to what's next.